Let's burn some timber, add some epoxy, sprinkle in a little gravel, and turn it into a gorgeous clock. Oh, and we'll stuff up a few things along the way. We were tasked with a simple but fun challenge by this guy, Phil, from Gradually Wizardly. What better motivation does one need to get creative in the workshop? The challenge? Build something you couldn't have built five years ago and give it away to someone you care about. So I thought to myself, what couldn't I do five years ago? Digital design, epoxy work, CNC work. Yeah, none of it. Pretty much everything you see on this channel is a product of the past three years after moving away from on-site carpentry work. After deciding to take part in the challenge, I decided I'm going to build a clock. So me being me, I jumped in a Fusion 360 and started to sketch it out. Once I was done, I was really proud of what I designed. I thought to myself, our daughter Jazz will love this. She'll find it so cool. I showed it to her. You know what she said? That's boring, Dad. There's something so nice about the honesty of a four-year-old. Not worried about my feelings, she just spoke the honest truth. It was boring. It was just a clock. Let the brainstorming begin. It was very easy to brainstorm. I said to Jazz, what would make it cooler? If it looked like a volcano. So it was on. I fired up the barbecue. Well, not really a barbecue. It was a wheelbarrow with a metal bucket in it. After roughly cutting out the timber to a cool looking pattern, with the jigsaw and then shaping it with 40 grit sandpaper on the sander, we set it on fire. This probably would have been a whole heap easier with a propane torch. You work with what you've got. Once we were happy with the amount of charring on the timber, I set those aside to cool and I turned my attention to the CNC. Don't stress, you could do all of this by hand with a template. I've got a CNC, I enjoy using it, so that's all we're going to do. We are simply cutting out a template using MDF for two reasons. The first being it'll allow us to perfectly shape the outsides of the charred timbers. And the second being, it allows us to test our file. We're about to put, I don't know, about a week's worth of work in making the epoxy clock. We don't want to stuff that up by running a file and then miss cutting something, which we do anyway, but we'll get to that. So test it first on MDF because MDF is cheap, easy to cut, and it'll allow you to make sure it is going to be precise when you use it on the final product. I'm a big believer in sealing your timber prior to an epoxy pour. Whether that's right or wrong, I'm not sure. It generally starts a lot of arguments among makers. This is what I do. This is going to provide two major benefits. It's going to prevent air escaping from the timber during your main epoxy pour, preventing bubbles. But it's also going to seal in that charring so we don't get it over our tools, fingers, pretty much everything because it's just going to go everywhere if we don't do it. You may have noticed that our timber is currently about 45 mil thick. We're not making a 45 millimeter, that's for sure. The reason we did this was to prevent cupping in the timber. We only need the timbers to be about 12 millimeters thick, but had we have cut it down to 12 mil first for charring the timber, it would have bowed significantly. So I'm whipping up a quick little sled here to allow me to double stick tape the timbers face down and send it through the planer. Thickness it's a final thickness and get a nice flat underside so it sits in the mold securely. When we set these out on the template, it really starts to take shape. To get the perfect arc, curve, contour, curve, curve, we'll go with curve. To get the perfect curve on the edge of the timbers, we're going to double stick tape them down so then we can flush trim them off. It's just going to allow it to sit so much snugger in the mold, reducing the amount of wasted space, maximizing the size of our clock. I'm not going to lie. The only thing going through my head right now is don't break, don't break, don't break. Phew. That was stressful. Not going to lie. We're going to double stick tape into the mold simply because getting a clamp or weighing these down would be an absolute nightmare. They are odd shape. They're not smooth on top. I don't want to damage the top. I just thought this was going to be the easiest way to secure them into the mold. It's epoxy time. We're going to do this in three separate pores. The reason being is to give a really good depth to this project. The bottom layer is going to be solid color. Then we're going to do a layer of translucent color. So it's slightly see-through, really shows off the character of the timber and the secret ingredient of 
gravel. Yes, I raided in my garden. And then the final pour will be a clear glass coat to just really make pop. Does anyone else find epoxy pouring really satisfying to watch or is it just me? Am I the odd one here or is this normal? Because I could watch this all day. Maybe not all day, but I could watch this a lot. It's very satisfying. I'm just going to use a syringe to pump into the cracks and crevices some of the color. I don't want to pour it over the top because I'm going to get too much in there. I'm also using a range of different colors being red, purple, and gold just to try and really make this as authentic as possible without being actual lava. Then we hit it with a little heat to pop any of those bubbles that are rising to the surface. You didn't think I was serious when I said I raided my garden for the gravel, did you? We're going to give it a good wash. Even though it is brand new and not from the garden, it's going to be covered in dust and impurities that we don't want to get into our resin. So good wash and then a really good dry. So we're going to pat it dry, then we'll probably leave it for a few hours. If my wife is watching, I didn't do what I'm about to tell you, but I may have put it in the oven to just you know, really make sure it's dry. But I wouldn't use the household oven for something like this. Never. Okay, so I've taken off my respirator just so I can talk you through this part. But what you're looking for before you swirl is for it to thicken up. If you swirl too early, you're just going to mix all the colors and it's not going to work and come out nice. So I'm hoping the little camera here can catch this. But as you put in and pull up, it should look really thick. When you're at that point, go ahead and swirl. I like to use a skewer because it keeps everything nice and fine. We're going to go ahead and sprinkle in our gravel now, which was a bad idea in hindsight because it just sinks to the bottom of the resin. Don't do this if you're going to put gravel in resin. Put it in your second pour like this because it keeps everything nice and together and it doesn't just sink straight down. Gives us the opportunity to get some clumps and nice patterns throughout. This is pour number two, our translucent pour or semi-translucent. We don't want to hide the character of everything we've just done. So we're simply going to use about a quarter of the amount of pigment as we used before to just try and make everything pop. It'll also give a lot of depth to the finished project rather than just doing a solid pour and then a simple clear pour. I'm just going to use a skewer to assist the epoxy into the cracks and crevices of the gravel because this layer is going to do all the holding and keep everything together. And then exactly like before, wait until the epoxy sets up and swirl again. This simply ensures that we're blending the two colors together in a pattern rather than just mixing them together while they're still wet. Pour number three, the clear coat. Well, the first clear coat. The only thing I do differently to a clear coat as opposed to a colored mix when it's a deep pour epoxy is I like to sit it in hot water once I've mixed it up to help the bubbles escape before pouring. I just find it gives it a clearer look if you do that rather than pour straight away. No idea if that's truthful, but that's what I find. Now, this is where we stuffed up a little bit, but we're going to fix that. I didn't pour enough of the solid color epoxy on the base layer. So I need to pour an extra 10 millimeter thick layer so that when we route in our clock mechanism, all concealed within the color. If we did it now, you'd actually see the mechanism through the clear coat, which would look horrendous. So I'm just jerry-rigging up a nice form using some tape. The tape was very flimsy, so I came back with some cloth tape to really stiffen it up. But it's not my finest work. It did work. Yeah, it's a little bit, mm, let's just say not great. You'll also see what happens when you leave your epoxy cure for too long before swirling. Don't do this. You want to give it about two hours, but come back and check it periodically. Because once it's gone too far, there's no going back and you can't swirl it. Despite me trying and trying again. Thankfully, this is the back. Now, this is where we're going to get a little creative on the sand seat. We are going to make a reference board. To explain what that is, it is basically a board that we are not going to move on our sand seat until the project's done. And it's going to have pinholes where we can put some dowels in to allow us to line everything up to make sure all of our mechanisms line up in reference with the clock face. We're going to give the backside a quick surface on the sand seat to get it nice and 
flat. You can see we've propped it up slightly just because some of the gravel is still poking through. So we weren't getting it nice and flat and we just found it easier to prop it up rather than pack and shim and all of that sort of thing. While we've got it on the sand see, we're going to go and cut out our reference hole in the center as well as profile cut around the perimeter to get the shape and the center mark dialed in. Quick bit of advice, if you're going to use a CNC to cut out your clock, make sure your zero zero is correct before you ruin two weeks of work. Center, hole, center, hole, bugger. Round two, I can confirm this goes a lot smoother than the last time. Just a quick little hatch in our hole that was not required. Nothing a syringe full of epoxy can't fix. So I absolutely hate, and I mean hate, how the edges of this turned out. You've got layers of timber, some of it's charred, some of it's not charred. Then you can see some gravel, clear epoxy, translucent epoxy, colored epoxy. It's just so busy and messy. So I've just gone ahead and taped off the entire top and bottom. Absolute waste of time considering I've got to sand this anyway, but I did it. So I'm taking some black spray paint and I'm just going to lather the sides to conceal all of that. And then when we sand this, it'll give us a nice crisp edge around the perimeter. It looks a heap better than seeing that edge that's charred, not charred, gravel. Yeah, you, you get the picture. And we get a really nice clip. Pull on that tape off. Time to scuff up that nice epoxy. Yep. We're going ahead with a tabletop or glass coat epoxy. So we're going to scuff the whole thing before pouring that on top. I'm just using 80 grit sandpaper to just really give it a quick work over until it's all a consistent milk color. Cloudy color. Cloudy color. Now this is where everything goes pear shaped. You know how before I said I like to heat up my epoxy once it's been mixed to knock out all those air bubbles? That's only with deep pour epoxy, as I've now found out. With tabletop epoxy, cures and flash cures a lot quicker. So we're going to walk through everything we did wrong right. First one is don't mix it with an electric mixer, in my case, a drill. What that does is it beats way too much air in. Pour it immediately. Don't let it sit because the heat generated is ridiculous. Now, when I say ridiculous, I put my finger in there and I was so thankful I was wearing the gloves because it would have burnt. I would have had third degree burns. It would have been really, really bad. Did not realize how hot it was going to get and how quickly it was going to flash cure. Oh, and then instead of going, hey, this didn't work, I thought I'm going to pour it on my project anyway and see what it looks like. Bad call. Let's try that again. What you want to do is mix up your epoxy by hand using a paint stirrer. This will limit the amount of air that gets beaten into the epoxy, giving a much more bubble-free finish. You also want to pour it immediately so that the heat doesn't generate in the vessel, in my case, the bucket. Once you've poured it, let it sit for about 15 minutes and the bubbles will slowly creep to the top, allowing you to hit that with a heat gun or blowtorch, hopping them. Much, much better finish this time around. Once that's cured, we're going to go and give it a quick sand on the bottom side just to knock off those drips because we want to be able to sit this flat on the sand seat. Now, this is where those reference pins come into play. By tapping the center pin in, we can then line that clock back perfectly with the CNC so we can route in the front face, then flip it over, align those grooves up with the other pins to get our hardware positioned perfectly on the back. Okay, so we've got a pro tip here. If you're going to use gravel in your epoxy pour, don't put it in the path of the CNC. The bits do not like it at all. You may have saw me put the pins in and take the pins out earlier on. That is because I was only supposed to put the center pin in. So now we're going to put the other pins in because we have the reference screws already cut. We need to use the CNC to cut them down to a consistent height just to make sure everything slots in perfectly. Little bit of lining stuff up. But once we've got it locked in, we can cut in for our clock hardware and our mounting hardware. There is something so satisfying about getting such a snug fit. Is it necessary? Yes. Yes, it is. I mean, for me, for me. Could you just drill a 80 mil hole? Yeah, that'd work too. But what's the fun in that? We're perfectionists. That's why we would work, isn't it? It's so exciting when it starts to look like a clock. We're just using white epoxy and a syringe. 
to fill in the grooves we just cut. That'll make telling the time a lot easier because no one wants to try and work out which way the hands are facing. That's just silly. Sanding time. Doesn't everyone love sanding? The main reason to sand this is to get it all flat. We're starting at about 80 grit, working up the grits all the way to 400 before giving you a good clean off and applying some clear coat. The clear coat really makes this project hot. I'm giving it a good five coats because I want it to be really glossy. That's just the finish I'm looking for in this project. So we go spray, 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 sand, 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 spray, 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 sand, sand, sand. To get the best finish, gets it nice and flat and looks magical. Time to fit the hardware. Now you can see why it's so worth that extra effort to make everything line up perfectly. Except when you forget about the finish and it stops everything lining up perfectly because you cut the hole too snug. It still looks good, but it was so much nicer before the finish went on. And no, I'm not going to recut it. I'm not that OCD. The clock mechanism is pretty easy to install. You just poke it through the back, install the washers that come with it. But there is a little bit of a trick with getting the hands right and allowing the time be accurate. What you want to do is fit your hands. So there are two hands. One has a circle in it. One has a square or rectangle, generally speaking. Circle one goes on first, which is your shorter hand, generally speaking. Then you want to put your longer hand on. Snug the nut up to hold everything in place. Now, this is the key. Using the adjuster on the back, you don't want to spin the clock hand. They, the mechanisms are made of plastic. They'll break quite easily. So using the adjuster on the back, face the long hand to 12 o'clock. That's straight up for those who don't know how to read analog clock, me being those people. I grew up in a digital world. Come on, guys. Then hold that in position using the adjuster on the back. Using your finger, rotate the back hand to line up. You want everything facing straight up and down because then when you run the clock, it's going to look accurate. We are absolutely wrapped with how this turned out. What do you guys think? As part of the challenge set by Phil, we needed to give this away to someone we care about. I have just the person in mind, and I think they're going to love this clock because they have no idea how to turn up on time. So I feel a clock is a necessity. Now, if you've liked this video and the creativity that's gone into it, I think you're going to love what we've linked on the screen. As always, happy building. Thanks for watching. Cheers, guys.